What you're about to hear is an audio tape with Werner Earhart called Relationships Making Them Work. This material is excerpted from a series of courses on relationships and the S standard training. Although it shouldn't be confused with a complete course on relationships, it has been designed in such a way that it will support you in making your own relationships work. You'll hear Werner, interactions with participants, and several exercises, one of which requires a pencil and paper. The first section we're going to hear is taken from a course on relationships in 1975, where Werner talks about just what a relationship is and what it isn't. If you take the dictionary and look up the word relationship, and then you look up the words that define relationship, and you make a definition out of the words that define relationship, what you get is that relationship is an understanding and being aware of another person's way of being. So a relationship is an understanding and a being aware of another person's way of being. Relationship is the condition of understanding and being aware of another person. Now, so that we don't leave anyone confused, we also want to contrast what we are looking for with what we're not looking for, because often the contrast allows us to be clear. And so we have the word involvement. You see, people who are related oftentimes get the idea that they're involved. And if you're involved, the involvement may be shoving the relationship out of the way. So it's a good idea to be very clear about what involvement means. To be involved in a relationship means to make intricate, tangled, or complicated. <laughs> right out of the dictionary, by the way. Involvement means to entangle in trouble, difficulty, danger, etc. Implicate. To involve, to be involved, is to draw or hold within itself. It's a very interesting thing. To draw or hold within itself. In other words, a relationship which is exclusive, which excludes the world, a relationship which makes no contribution to the world, a relationship which doesn't express itself in the world, is an involvement not a relationship. Involvement means to include by necessity. Relationships aren't a function of necessity. Involvements are a function of necessity. Involvement means to make busy, employ, or occupy. And an awful lot of people are simply taking up their time with their relationships because they haven't got anything better to do. That's an involvement, not a relationship. Entanglement is another good way of looking at what we're not talking about because many people are entangled in their relationships. And entanglement means to involve in as in a tangle, to catch as in a net, vine, etc., so that escape is difficult. Now we'll go into the S yes training. It's late on the last day, and Werner elaborates on this issue. Now, one of you very clever people who's been through enough love affairs to know one's enough. <laughs> what do you do? What do you do to keep the other person around so that they can't get away from you when you decide that you can't live without them? You've got to keep them around. What do you do to keep them around? Tell them you love them. Because why? Because if I love her, she can't live without me. That's the one thing nobody can live without. So I say, I love you. <laughs> See? You all been through it. Every last one of you have done it. I love you. See, what you're waiting for is for her to say, I love you too. Oh. Now it's terrific. She says, I love you, and I say, I love you. And she says, I love you, and I say, I love you. It's terrific. It feels great, you know? But it's just beautiful. After a while, that wears out. I love you. So what? <laughs> you 
know, so what, what else you got? <laughs> now let's go back to where we left off in the relationships course. You see, this business about going over definitions is a very useful thing. Because if you've got something from which escape is difficult, and you're calling it a relationship, you have made a big mistake. <laughs> that isn't a relationship, that's an entanglement. Entanglement means to involve in difficulty. It's, it's interesting because if you read this, it sounds like you're reading a description of most people's relationship. And that's why I wanted to go over these definitions. I think it's very important to understand that that is not what a relationship is. So if you've got a thing which has involved you in great difficulty, and you've been calling that a relationship, you want to stop that. That's not a relationship, it's an entanglement. And the beginning of the mastery of anything, the beginning of the experience of satisfaction in any area, has to do with telling the truth. In this next segment, we'll be doing an exercise in which you can look at the goals you have in your relationships. Although it's not necessary to write things down, it's actually very useful for you to do this exercise with pencil and paper. So if you will, I'd like you now to get out your notebook, and I'd like you to write in the notebook some goals. What we're talking about here are specific measurable objectives. In other words, something like, what is it that you now don't have in a particular relationship you would like to have, or like to have the ability to have? So you might express your goal in terms of a new ability. You might express your goal in terms of a new something to happen in your relationship, in a particular relationship. You might express your goal in terms of something which is in your relationship that you'd like to get out of your relationship. So what I'd like you to do now is to start writing in your notebook. Start writing some specific goals You may find some goals, if you remember back to the definition of involvement and entanglement. Write down perhaps the problems in your relationships. Be specific. Make it a particular relationship or a particular person. If you're doing something in your relationship that you want to stop doing, write that down. If you're not doing something in your relationship that you want to start doing, write that down. Which one of your fantasies would you like to have come true? If you want to say it that way. Which one of your desires would you like to see come into being? Which one of your hopes? What is it that you want that you'd like to have? Be specific. Be clear. Make sure you limit the boundary of the result you want so that it's specific, and make sure you state it in terms the achievement of which can be measured so that you know if you've accomplished it. Well, almost anything is measurable if you think, it can, if you think it's measurable. For instance, I, I could say that 
what I wanted to do in my relationships was be happier. Now, I have to be very clear that being happier ain't much, you know? Because happier is anything from an inch to a mile. It is measurable. So a month from now, I could look down and I could see that what I wanted to be a month before was happier, and I am happier. I'm not much happier. I'm not happy enough to be happy, <laughs> but I'm happier. So measurable means something that you can tell if you've accomplished it or not. By the way, if you've got one thing down there or two things down there and you think you got it, you ain't got it. If you only had one or two things in your relationships that you wanted to accomplish, uh, you would probably be at least three feet off the floor. So keep looking. When you get tired of adding more, add some more. When you get bored with it, add some more. When you get annoyed with it, add some more. If you're kind of stuck, go back over the ones you've got and clean them up a little bit, you'll get some more. Make them more specific, make them more exact, make them clearer. Say them exactly the way you want them. Imagine that somebody with a wand was going to come along and touch you on the head and you were going to get those things. But you were going to get them exactly as you got them. Make them clear and accurate and specific. You see, a part of the game that the mind plays to create dissatisfaction is that it won't be specific. The mind works in generalities. In order to beat it at its own game, you must be willing to get things clear, to make things specific, to pin them down. If you run out of things, Clean up the ones you've already got. They'll remind you of some more as you get them cleaned up. Until finally you begin to realize that you've got a fairly complete list. Do you notice how hard this has been? That's amazing. People don't get why they can't get what they want, you know? See, one of the things that will surely keep you from getting what you want is not knowing it. Got about a half a minute to go. Okay? Please finish that by finishing off the number that you're on. When you're finished with the number you're on, don't go any further. In the following talk from 1976, Werner discusses the ability to create complete relationships. First, I want to be absolutely clear about what it means to be complete in a relationship. In the dictionary, the definition of completing, the exact definition of completing, as a matter of fact, is to make whole, full, or perfect. Complete implies the inclusion of all that is required for the integrity, perfection, or fulfillment of something. When something is complete, it is experienced exactly as it is. That is to say, it is experienced as it is without being obscured by the way it should be. So when something's complete, 
the should be's and the ought to be's and the way you want it to be or your concepts about it or your your ideals about it or the agreed on ideals about this thing that you're complete with or the comparison with other things or people what you really work towards to put together or have when something's complete all that's kind of dropped away from it when something is complete it's also fulfilled there's no need for something else now that doesn't mean that it wouldn't be pleasant to have other things in it it's just that you no longer have any need you no longer are attached to having something else with it and you no longer have any need for some part of it not to be there there's no sense that it could be better it's simply the way it is there's no sense that it should be different to be complete means not to experience a sense of insufficiency or inadequacy there is simply a sense of what is and so a relationship is complete that is to say a relationship is perfect when it is as it is when it is allowed to be the way it is when it's accepted the way it is not not accepted in terms of becoming the victim of it you know or the effect of it or having it thrust upon you but really accepting it you know opening yourself up to it creating the space for it to be the way it is okay i have a question um i'm stuck and i don't know what to do to get unstuck <clears throat> um i'm very clear that i'm acting out my parents marriage and relationship um my mother found things in my father that she didn't like and for 40 years she punished him she's still punishing for him for it and i'm doing the same thing now and i see it and i don't know what to do to not do it and um my est experience tells me that i'm supposed to do nothing and what i come up with is that i don't know how to do nothing well i'll tell you how to do nothing when you're punishing somebody when you're finding things in people that you can punish them for what you should do is to find things in people that you can punish them for now what that means andrea is that you've got to give up trying to get rid of that see uh, if you're an alcoholic, one of the things which is true about you is that you're an alcoholic. And when you finally get that you are an alcoholic and have accepted that, you have some chance, small chance, but some small chance of being able to behave like people who are not alcoholics, but you never stop being an alcoholic. See, the day an alcoholic stops being an alcoholic, he or she goes back to drinking. So the same thing is true with people who find fault with others so that they can... Be right. Well, so they can be whatever, yes. Uh, what you need to be willing to do is to get that, you know, that's how you are. And uh, people, uh, with, uh, people with one arm get along in life, and people without eyes get along in life, and people can't get, who can't hear get along in life, and they seem to have as much fun and get as much out of life as the rest of us. So I would imagine that people who find fault with other people in order to make them wrong get along in life, too, if they want to. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Very nice. Thank you. One of the things I want you to be very clear about as far as relationships go, you can be related only to the degree that you can let the things in the space of relationship be. I'll say it again. To the degree that you can allow those things which are in the space of being related to be to the degree that you can allow things to be, to that degree you can be. What I mean by that is this. There are two states in which things exist. One of the states in which things exist is a state called something. So a thing can exist as something. 
something which exists as something changes its state from the state of something, from existing as something, to existing in a totally different state when you complete your experience of it, when you let it be totally. It goes from the state of something, it goes from existing as something to the state of everything. It moves into that state called everything. which if you've been through the training you at least heard is also nothing. So a thing can exist as something and a thing can exist as everything nothing. When it exists as everything nothing, you are no longer the effect of it. You are then able to create it and you are not the effect of it. The way you alter something from the state of something to the state of everything nothing is by letting it be, is by allowing yourself to complete your experience of it. So to the degree that you can complete your experience with those things that you've been resisting experiencing, to that degree you can be, and since we're talking about relationships, to that degree you can be related. So if something tragic, something awful, and something horrible comes up, or some degree of that, something uncomfortable, something unpleasant, something unwanted comes up. Whatever it is that comes up, to the degree that you can let it be, to the degree that you are willing to complete your experience of it, to that degree you've become more alive in your relationships. Therefore, I say that what comes up is your friend. What follows is Werner's answer to a question about how to handle jealousy in a relationship. Uh, I don't really have advice for people, except one thing, and that is don't take any advice. Uh, so I always like to tell people that I have nothing to say about their situation. However, I am definitely willing to share with you my experience, my insights, the abstractions that I've created. And if those things, if you use those things to create some value for you, then I'm very pleased. And my, I, I assume that's what you're asking is for me to share any insight I've got into the area which you can use to gain your own insight. So that's really what I'm going to do. Uh, first off, if you had a, you said that you started out the relationship and you said that it was satisfying and that's great. And then you said that trouble came into the relationship. One of the things that I can assure you is that if you complete your relationships and they become satisfying, you are going to get trouble. The one thing which always follows satisfaction is dissatisfaction. Because you see, what we do with the satisfaction we gain is we try to hold on to it. And satisfaction held on to is mechanical and therefore the antithesis of, of satisfaction. You can't hold on to satisfaction. You can only create it. And the only way you can create anything is if you've got space to create it in. And the only way you've got any space to create anything in is your willingness to complete what you've got. So it's the dissatisfaction which, when completed, creates space for satisfaction. Now, what the relationship did was to allow you to confront another chunk of life, another part of, to put it in an Eastern discipline, your karma. Your karma is to have a relationship with a woman that goes well and then have her want to go out with other men. I say it's your karma simply because that's what you say happened. And what happens is your karma, you see? <laughs> you don't have to be very wise about that. At any rate, you see, ultimately the quality of our lives, ultimately now, you know, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there's a... Uh, uh, beginning, an interim, and an end. Ultimately, the quality of our lives is a reflection of how much we can confront. 
just how much of the world can you handle? Well, one part of the world, which you're going to get a chance to handle now, one way or another, you're going to get a chance to handle having a successful relationship with a woman and have her want to go out with other men. So my, my advice is don't solve those problems. My advice actually is don't solve any problems. My advice is to be with them, to experience them, to go through whatever suffering there is, if you'll allow me to use that word, to go through whatever suffering there is in connection with those things and keep expanding your willingness to create space for those things. Now, I have to tell you, I hate the way that sounds. Because it sounds like I'm asking you to be long-suffering. I hate long-suffering stuff. <laughs> I'm for short-suffering. So my way of knowing about how to shorten the suffering is to accept it, to take responsibility for it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. What I wanted to ask is, um, it seems my main fear is a fear of rejection, especially in an intimate relationship. And... Uh, I just wonder how to go about um, overcoming it or making it disappear. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the first thing that you do to handle it is to be able to be aware of it. And if you can stand up in front of uh, 6,000 people and communicate it, you are definitely on the way to dumping your fear of rejection. You're going to have to pick up some new baggage pretty soon because you're certainly, <laughs> certainly not going to have that to carry around anymore. At any rate, see, most people have their relationships together pretty good, and they don't have any problems in their relationships, and they're all well-organized, and they're well-adjusted, well-balanced people with no problems. <laughs> and there's no satisfaction in their relationships, and they can't, for the life of them, figure out why. So if you've taken the step up to be able to identify one of the barriers in your relationship, one of the barriers to the experience of satisfaction in your relationships, you are definitely a step up. And that's why I say that the first step in handling barriers to completing relationships is to be aware of the barriers. In large measure, that is actually all you need to do. The place where you're going, so you have a kind of place to go, a map, the ground you need to cover is the ground between recognizing that you've got the barrier and that's really success already. You've already succeeded once you recognize the barrier. Where that puts you is on a trip, the end of which is being the source of the barrier, being that one who creates the barrier. As a matter of fact, if I were going to do a process with you about the fear of rejection, what I would do is to have you create the fear of rejection and just create more of it, and create more of it. You know, if you can create a whole auditorium full of the fear of rejection, by that time you are so the master of fear of rejection, you can just let it be. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Werner, hi. Hi, Susan. Um, <laughs> I'm going through a lot of spaces just sit, standing here. Yes, I know. Uh, good. <laughs> Me too. Um, and they have to... <laughs> 
They have to do with being important and having an important thing to share. Uh-huh. And I don't. Okay. So I've got that out, and I'm going to share. <laughs> Great. Um, my act, or the biggest thing right now for me that I have to give up, is being in control of my life. And that's really scary for me, because I've always been in charge of every situation. And thinking about giving that up, you know, what's what's underneath that? It's like I'm at the mercy of other people. So. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad that Susan brought that up because there's, uh, that's really important. Uh, you and I, we created everybody else. And the one problem with creating something is that immediately after you create it you become the effect of it you got to give up control see you have ultimate control in that you're allowed to create things and then even after that you've got ultimate control in that you're allowed to create the space in which they exist and then even after that you've got ultimate control in that you can recreate them so that they can disappear but during that little process you are completely out of control and the only way to regain control when you're out of control is to be out of control you get that Does that <laughs> penetrate so you see all these people you're the effect of all these people Look, I'd be, you know, out sailing in the bay if it weren't for you. <laughs> of course, also, if it weren't for you, I wouldn't exist, you see. <laughs> so it has its balancing aspects. <laughs> I'm really glad Susan brought it up to be very straight about it for a moment. One really must learn to be in total control out of control and and if you've done any uh, if you've learned to ski if you can ski it may be different I don't know about being able to ski because I can't ski but I've learned to ski three or four times <laughs> uh, I, I, I learned to uh, hang glide I had one hang gliding experience it was a one second flight to a crash on the side of the mountain in Aspen so I know a lot about being out of control, you see. And uh, one of the things I know from my experiences of being out of control, and I've been told by other people who are really experts at various uh, sport forms, is that you really need to let go. You really need to be willing to, to let it happen, you know, to take its course. And in that moment of letting go, as you let go, Suddenly, you gain true control, not force, not dominance, not the ability to push it around or shove it or form it or reform it or all those other words, but the ability to truly control it. One of the best experiences I've had of that in my own, in my own life that just happened to come to me a minute ago was an experience of going down uh, the rapids in some river or other, and we got out of the uh, rafts and uh, jumped into the rapids and went down just, uh, you know, body-wise. No raft, just body. And uh, you got taken along by the water with an incredible amount of force. And your first impulse is to resist it. Now, fortunately, the river is so big that you can't resist it. And so you get to have this experience whether you want to or not. <laughs> you do actually let go. And the instant you let go and you're willing to be out of control, you're willing to be swept along by the river, if you stay conscious, little if in there, if you stay conscious at that moment, you realize that you're able to direct the motion of your body through the rapids, that you can go around the stones, that you can avoid things, and that it doesn't take any effort, you know? The water doesn't go into the stones, you see, it goes around the stones.
The people who resisted, they got inserted into stones. <laughs> Susan, thank you very much for that. That was really great. I want to recommend to you that you let it hang out in your relationships. Please. Hi, Warner. Hi. Well, the situation I find myself in is uh, I'm in a sexual relationship with a person, and I've, lately I've been having really good relationships with other people and not getting, well, going through stuff, but I can handle it, kind of. Great. When I'm with this person, uh, all my stuff comes up extra strong, and I, got, uh, I really get obsessed with all my patterns, and I just feel you know, real involved in all this stuff, and I don't even want to be around him because it comes up so much, although I do want to be around him. And that's basically it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sex is a great involvement. Uh, it may be that the only cure for that involvement is old age. <laughs> My own, my own view on that matter is that the most important thing a person's got to do about sex is lighten up. Mm. That uh, you know, it is. It's it's a it's really incredibly survival oriented, and that isn't very difficult to to understand. I mean, it's the way we procreate and the way we keep the species going and the way we keep the race going and the way we keep the you know the human race going and uh, <laughs> the other one too yes the rat race uh, at any rate I think the most important thing a person can, you see what what happens is the whole thing becomes so clouded and so enmeshed and entangled that there isn't any way to get any clarity on it. So even if somebody says something that, that makes any sense, or even if you get a little peek through the clouds uh, and you get a moment of clarity, it, doesn't really ver it isn't really very useful. It doesn't, it doesn't do much. So my own view about the whole business about sex is that we ought to lighten up about it. We ought to reduce it in significance. Uh, we ought to allow ourselves the space to be crazy about sex, because we are. <laughs> Next, we'll go back into the training where Werner talks about how to be attractive. I want to tell you something else about handling people of the opposite sex. What I'll really tell you is how to be attractive. You've seen people who are not particularly handsome, who are somehow very attractive. People who don't, whose, whose, you know, features aren't organized like we like them to be organized, but somehow they're really attractive people, you know? Everyone know what I'm talking about? You tell the difference between attractive people and unattractive people. Attractive people are interested. Unattractive people are interesting. You want to be attractive? You want to get people to play with? Be interested. You want to spend time by yourself? Be interesting. This is very, takes all the mystery out of it, you notice? I mean, you know, all that stuff you're doing to get dressed up so that they'll really like it the way they see it? They can't even see you. They're too worried about what they look like. They got all their attention on what they look like. How are they going to see you? I'll tell you what, if you walk in and say, oh, that's interesting what you're wearing. Oh, noticed. How about that? That makes you interesting, that you're interested. In 1975, Werner talked about what is probably the most fundamental aspect of making relationships work. 
Okay, we're now ready to move into, as you can see, I actually have been moving into, the part of a relationship with, which is creative. And the crux of the creative aspect of a relationship is very, very simple. You cannot complete, listen, you cannot complete a relationship with anyone that you do not admire and respect as they are now. I am sorry. I really wish it were easier. <laughs> there are some people that I have to get all the admiration and respect that I can get together, together, to admire and respect. But that's the way it is. It's really the way it is. You are stuck with those people you do not admire and respect. You see, it's a beautiful trap. You're going to get to keep them around in one form or another. If you get rid of them, you only get another one the same way. You get to keep them, and if you get one that doesn't look like it's the same way, it will become the same way. <laughs> you have to make it the same way. It's something you haven't completed. You can't complete a relationship with someone you don't admire and respect. And some people make it damn difficult too bad. You see, it's a very interesting thing, but the truth of the matter is that the only reason, the only cause of not admiring and respecting someone is something within yourself. I know that's a difficult thing, and I don't want to lay it on you and burden you with it so that each time you meet somebody you don't admire and respect, you have to go through a whole soul-searching business. And yet I would like you to kind of hold your information in that, in that matrix, if you will, to know that when you meet someone who you can't admire and respect, you are simply looking at those things in yourself which you can't tolerate. And so to complete the relationship, to allow the relationship to be in a space of satisfaction, you must be willing to admire and respect those people with whom you relate. Miracles have been happening in my relationships. I was actually able to communicate with my father about my relationship with my mother and my relationship with him. And I mean, I've never been able to communicate anything in my family. You know, what's been really going on with me? And here I was telling my father that I am so stuck at wanting my mother to be lovable before I love her. You know, it's like I'm holding out for her to get lovable. And she... And I mean, I really get that she's not going to change, and I have the choice of whether to love her and, and to get satisfaction out of that relationship or to be stuck on it and not love her. So I feel like I'm at the crossroad. I, I can choose whether to get off it and love her exactly the way she is <laughs> or not love her. And I'm willing to get off it. Um, I have a sense that if I can let my mother be exactly the way she is with me, that she will do anything for me. Yep. It's just, it's incredible. Thank you yeah, very much for that. <laughs> really, it's something you've got to take a look at here on for yourself. Are you willing for your parents to make it with you? 
Now listen to me very carefully. Are you willing for your parents to make it with you? You know, really make it with you. Are you willing to admire and respect and love and support and, and accept? Are you willing for your parents to make it with you just exactly like they are? You know, without any of those wonderful qualities that the other kids' parents had. <laughs> and are you willing for your parents to make it with you? Again, remember what make it with you means. I don't mean you've got to force yourself to accept your parents. You can't do it anyhow. Man, you hear the words willing. It's like, would it be all right with you to wake up tomorrow morning and find out that your parents were totally acceptable to you, that you admired them and respected them and loved them, that you felt affinity for them, that you enjoyed them, and they still had all those qualities that embarrassed you when you were a child. So you need to confront that because in order to be complete in your relationship with your parents, you really have to allow your parents to make it with you as your parents so that they can so that it is their experience that they have succeeded as your parents you have to create for them the space in which they can experience that they have made it as your parents that they've succeeded that that they've made it you know at least in their role as parents they've they've won they've succeeded they've handled that now you've got, see, what you need to take a look at is are you willing for your parents to make it with you just exactly like they are without the addition of any of those other qualities or, or, or things that you thought they ought to have and without the subtraction of any of those qualities or things you think they shouldn't have. Would that be okay? Would it be all right with you to have that experience? Are you willing to experience your parents as being all right with you? That, that's really at the heart of things. That was a beautiful opportunity. Thank you very much for that. Hi, Warner. I'm Hi. Tay. Say uh, your name again. Tay. Thank you, Tay. I was one of those people who, about 20 years ago, I put my parents out of my life <laughs> and spend the next 20 years and raise my fist, paying those bastards back for what they did to me. Yes. And uh, somewhere along the line, not so long ago, I realized that uh, I didn't pay anybody back, of course. What I wound up was, was with 20 years with no parents. And during the process... <laughs> <laughs> during the process, one of the lines of, of my tape that came up in the story was, well, the thing that they really never did for me is they never showed me that they loved me. And that was very important. That was a key line. But the line suddenly meant something different to me this time. Yes. The line, they never showed me that they loved me, made me realize that I understood that they did love me. I wanted to tell you a little story which you were sharing kind of reminded me of. I spoke, I guess, about three, four days ago at uh, the uh, Parent Effectiveness Training, the PET Trainers Convention, which was held in Amherst up in uh, Massachusetts. And uh, I talked about teenagers, and I told them that the most, one of the most important, the most important educational experience in my life was the experience that I've had in the teen training. And, uh, you know, then I told them my things about I was an expert on teenagers now, and that the first thing that I wanted to share with them was that teenagers were human. And that did not go over there somehow. Uh, but I told them that what we found out in the teen training, what I found out in the teen training, is that the most important, the absolutely the most important thing in an adolescent's life, absolutely the most important thing is not going to the dance, 
not the romance, not the first romance, not the not school. None of that stuff is really important. At least not none of that stuff is fundamentally important. That what was fundamentally important to a teenager was that they loved their parents absolutely. And the problem with being a teenager is the inability to express this, the inability to manifest it and communicate it and allow it and, and let it be there. And uh, when I was all done, I got off the platform and some people came up to talk. And there had been two young people who's, who were there, obviously, with their parents sitting over on my left on the floor down in front of the seats in the auditorium. And uh, they came over and one of them had tears in her eyes and she said, I really want to thank you for saying that because that's really, really what's true for me. And, ha and you having said that with my parents in the room gives me the opportunity, makes it okay for me to tell my parents that I really love them absolutely. And it was, uh, you know, it made that whole trip worthwhile. If nothing else it had happened that would have made that trip worthwhile. And I am so clear that what our lives are about when we don't get to express that, when we don't get, you know, when a teenager doesn't get to express that, what it does is begin to twist the teenager, you know? And it's, it's interesting, you can see them getting twisted, gnarled, and turned around, and you can watch them starting to put the film of peanut butter over all that gnarling so it looks good, you know? So that they can be adults and suppress all that twisting and turning and all those convolutions that the inability to express their absolute love for their parents uh, puts them through. So if you've gotten that today, if you've gotten in touch with your love for your parents, you really may be growing up today. I want to tell you that I grew up when I was 35 or 36, somewhere in there, where I really got that I loved my parents absolutely, that they were totally all right with me, exactly the way they were that I was willing to support them in being the way they were and they didn't have to be that way, they could be some other way and I would support that. And that I loved them absolutely and they were totally acceptable to me. And they've gotten so much better since then, by the way. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you, Werner. I'm Brian. Hi. Hi. Actually, most of my questions will, be will probably be answered during the day. Uh, I have some relationships that have ended through death, some close friends, uh, my father, uh, you know, so forth. And I'm just wondering now, how in the world do you clean up a relationship with somebody that's already passed away? I mean, you know, and maybe you don't have an answer right off, but, you know, anything that you can say would help. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, really, and a very important question. Almost all of us, in fact, I would guess that I don't know anyone in their teens who hasn't experienced the death of someone with whom they're related. And it's a problem for most of us. Most of us don't handle it all that well, and some of us have a really deep problem with it. And so it's something really worth discussing and, and, and getting clear about. Uh, and I'd like to take a look at it in two aspects, Brent, and I think that if we look at it in two aspects, it'll get pretty clear what it is that we're dealing with. And the two aspects are this, that when a person dies, what they leave behind is what you and I haven't experienced. In other words, if a person to whom you're related dies and, you're, and they die at that moment when your relationship with them is absolutely complete, then as a matter of fact, there's nothing left of them, there's nothing hanging around of them, there's no baggage left behind, there is merely space. In other words, there's the space to be related, to go on and be related with others, and, for, and perhaps even valuably related to the memory of that person or to the value of that person, as I would prefer to say it. So when a loved one dies, when a person with whom you're related dies, and you're left stuck with something, you can complete what you're left stuck with as if they hadn't died 
because the part of them that you're stuck with hasn't died for you, hasn't been completed. Now, you see, death and completion are these two kind of words that keep going back and forth in front of each other, and it's worth getting it cleaned up. Essentially, the purpose of life is completion, and death is a kind of symbol of completion, or at least can be a symbol of completion. In the ordinary course of events, it's a symbol of incompletion. It's a symbol of failure, because I haven't gotten in life what I set out to get. Therefore, when I die, I no longer have the chance to get it. Therefore, I fail. So death is mostly a symbol of failure. So for you and I, when we're stuck with the death of someone, what we're stuck with is the part of the relationship that we didn't complete. And what we can do, even without the presence of that person, is to complete the relationship for ourselves. It's absolutely irrelevant to the completion of a relationship that the person be present or not. Perfectly all right for them to be present, and it's perfectly all right for them not to be present. What you need to complete is the part that wasn't complete, and that's stuck in you not in them. Thank you very much. This business about the past and the future and now, we need to get really cleared up, particularly the business about the past. And the most important thing I want to direct your attention to is the, big, is the business of forgiveness, of forgiving. Now, we don't use that word in S because the word has a lot of baggage attached to it. Uh, I would prefer the word completing, allowing to be. And the problem with forgiving is that people don't understand it very well. They think that if somebody does something wrong and you forgive them, that it's kind of like you say, well, it was all right for you to do it that time, but don't dare ever do it again. And that isn't the way life works. If somebody does it, you can bet they're going to do it again. <laughs> now, they'll fool you every once in a while. Once in a blue moon, they won't do it again. But I'll tell you, that's very rare that they don't do it again. You too. <laughs> you see, Let's talk about self-forgiveness. Let's talk about forgiving oneself. What isn't understood because of all the gobbledygook we've picked up from our culture, what isn't understood is that when you forgive somebody for something, and we're talking about self-forgiveness now, so what I mean is when you forgive yourself for something, you've got to create the space for that thing to exist. You see, what you and I keep forgetting is whatever we resist, that's what's going to manifest. Whatever you resist, you become. So if there's something in your past that you're ashamed of or guilty about, there's something in your past that you're hanging on to, or if there's something in your past that you're burdening the other person with in your relationship with them, that's incredibly stupid. And it's also stupid to forgive them or forgive yourself if what you mean by that is, I'll never do it again. That's a lie. You haven't got the remotest idea of what you will ever do again. And the probability is that you will do whatever you did before again. See, it's a very interesting thing. If you are ever going to transcend being that kind of person, you are going to have to to make it all right that you are that kind of person. Because any ounce of resistance to whatever, you do, to whatever degree you resist who you are, to that degree you are stuck being that. And, and the day on which, that moment at which you really experience that you created yourself being that way, you will never again have to be that way. You see, what people don't understand is you're only as high as you are low. 
The degree to which you can't take responsibility for yourself as a small and mean person, to that degree you cannot reach any higher. If I don't have space in my relationships with others for them to be small and mean, they have no room in which to grow. And I'll tell you, you can't ever create the space for anybody else if you can't create the space for yourself. One of the worst kinds of people in the world are good people. They're almost the worst kind of people because they themselves have put on this act of being good people which gives them the right not to give people the space to be bad people. And if you can't be bad, you can't really be good. Now, if you can't follow all this very precisely, what I'm really saying is lighten up. Don't bring all that seriousness about your relationships in here. <laughs> the other thing I want to tell you is that most of what you call relationship is not. And you know, it's an interesting thing. Most of the things that I found out that I have that are worth contributing uh, are uh, where I found out that we're calling something one thing when it isn't. See, people can't communicate because what they call communication isn't. And people can't relate because what they call relationship isn't. Ninety-nine percent of what you want in your association or connection with another person is not relationship. There are very few people in this room who are even interested in putting together a relationship. There are as few people in this room who are interested in putting together a relationship as there are people in this room who ought to be celibate. There are some people for whom a monastic life makes sense. Like there are a few people who ought to climb Everest, there are a few people who ought to live in monasteries. And there are a few people who ought to pursue relationships. About 99% of what you and I want from our association with other people, from our connection with other people, is not relationship at all. What, in fact, we really want is recreation. You see, if you could get that, your life would work. Especially your relationship with life would work. Because if you were willing to create recreation with the person that you're associated with, if you were willing to take the significance and the heaviness out of it that doesn't belong there in the first place, it would be damn cut and dry. And I'll tell you, that legitimizes what goes on so fast it makes your head shake. And I'll tell you what, out of a tremendous association for recreation can come the magic of a relationship. And without that recreation, you've got, got a hope in hell of having a relationship. The other part of that is that you can't Pursue a relationship. Why? Because you cannot pursue what is. You are already related. You can't pursue a relationship. You're already related. And you are... Related is like pregnant. You either is or you ain't. <laughs> See, you can't have degrees of relatedness. You are either related or you aren't. And you are related. You already are. You know there's nothing you can do about it. But I'd like to be clear with you that if you're, look, this business about creating relationships, you don't have to create a relationship. You already got one. That's all there is is relating. 
What you need to create is some recreation. You know, that's a little, you got to work on recreation. Now, some people will want to will want to play a game called relationship, and that's beautiful if you do. But be damn clear what you're letting yourself in for. The business of being related should be reserved for very few people. The number of people who should climb mountains seriously is probably related to the number of people who ought to pursue relationships seriously. You shouldn't even get involved if you aren't willing to play all out. Very bad to get up on the side of a mountain and quit. Relationship requires the kind of commitment that climbing mountains requires. And most of us shouldn't be doing it. I jumped out of an airplane once for recreation. And that's why I did it once. See, once was recreation. Twice, and it becomes a pursuit. I have no commitment to jumping out of airplanes. So, you hang around coming out of the fact that you are related, have some good recreation, and you're liable to fall out once. You know, you're liable to fall into a, rec into a relationship. It could happen. Probably stun you if it did. You know, you might never get over it. Recreation is refreshment in body or mind as after work by some form of play, amusement, or relaxation. Recreation is refreshment in body or mind as after work, as after anything, work being one of the things as after. See, one of the things as after recreation, you recreate too. <laughs> if you know how to recreate, I mean. So. Recreation is refreshment in body or mind as after work by some form of play, amusement, or relaxation. Can you imagine how much of your, quote, relationship, unquote, that leaves out? <laughs> Tragic. <laughs> It is. <laughs> oh. That's really looking that's really worth looking over. I mean that's worth really getting clear about, you know, really, 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 really clear about. What does it take to create a really powerful relationship? Let's go back into the training and take a look. Successful relationships are based on agreed-on goals. Judy and I are going to have a successful relationship. It doesn't make any difference, by the way, whether it's a marriage or a love affair or a business partnership or a... Where's Bill? Sales, sales encounter. It doesn't make any difference. You want to have a successful relationship? Very simple. Find out what the other person wants. Now, that ain't easy. Because most people don't... They haven't got the remotest guy... What do you want? I'm going to give you what you want. What do you want? Well, well, I don't know. Let me let me think for a while. Well, I, I want a, I want a pony. No, no, I don't want a pony. I want a wagon. No, I don't really want a wagon. Um, uh, I know what I want. I want to be a fireman. No, I don't want to be a fireman. By the way, let me. I want to tell you a little secret does not make any difference what you want. You don't want anything. One thing's as good as the other. Anything's all right. Honest, you know. Look, let me, let me, let me tell you something. Do you know that if you get to be the most famous person in the world, it ain't going to make a bit of difference in the quality of your life? Not a bit. Not a bit. That's hard to believe, isn't it? What determines the quality of your life in terms of goals 
It's just that you have them and function towards them intelligently, not what they are. So to have a successful relationship, I say, Judy, what do you want? She says, me? I want to be the world's greatest water skier. I say, Judy, I am now committed to your being the world's greatest water skier. You have my total support. I want to be the world's greatest mountain climber, and I am committed to that. Werner, you got my support for being the world's greatest mountain climber. Judy and I will have a successful relationship. We won't see much of each other, but it'll work out beautifully. We will have a successful relationship. I'm not kidding. And the degree to which I can be true to my commitment to Judy's success as a water skier, and the degree, by the way, to which Judy can be true to her commitment for her success as a water skier, and the degree to which I can be true to my commitment for success as a mountain climber, and Judy can be true to her commitment to me as a mountain climber, we can have a hell of a relationship. Great relationship. Really, it will work. Saying that bosses are the same thing. Look, what do you want? I'm going to give you what you want. What do you want? Tell me what you want. I'm going to give it to you. Or I'm going to leave, one or the other. I'm either going to give it to you or I'm going to leave. I want to know exactly what it is you want. Terrific. Now, you told me what you want. I am now committed on this job to your getting that from me. Here's what I want. You willing to commit yourself to seeing I get that? Terrific. You and I got a relationship. Now, that's how to make a working relationship. That'll work. Now, if you want to have a, a powerful relationship, now that's something different. In order to create a powerful relationship, you have to give up making the person you're going to relate to wrong. But you don't understand, Werner. He is wrong. <laughs> I don't make them wrong. I don't make them wrong. I just point it out to them. <laughs> I'm helping him. No, seriously, I'm only helping. Can't ever have a powerful relationship with anybody unless you are willing to give up making them wrong. Actually, did you ever notice in a romance a romance, particularly in the sexual aspect of a romance, you hold back just a little bit. Do you want to know why people don't give their all, everything they've got, really open themselves up and really <laughs> go with the thing? Because someday the fairy prince may come and you need to save something for the fairy prince. <laughs> or princess, as the case may be. You're going to give this nitwit everything? <laughs> Suppose the guy in the white charger comes in. What the fuck are you going to have for him? And you can never tell. He might come. You know, you can never tell. It's always hope. <laughs> Nobody's coming on a white charger. You better give it away right now. All of it. Don't hold any of it back. Werner has more to say on this in the relationships course. You don't need to wait for Prince Charming to come along. You can create being charmed and come from being charmed. You don't have to wait for somebody to do it to you. You can create this in the relationships you've got right now. I mean, you know how to work towards the images you've got in your relationships. You know, you know she ought to be like this. And that when she is, then you'll be happy with her. And you know he ought to stop being like that. And if he would, then, boy, would you put out. You got to give all that up today for at least as long as you're in here. You got to let go 
just absolutely let go, I'd like you to take a look at something. Would you be willing, without any circumstances changing, now listen, would you be willing, without any change of circumstance, listen, Would you be willing, without any change in circumstance, you know, if he still is like he was when you got here, and if she won't stop, whatever, would you be willing, with no alteration in your circumstances, to experience that your relationship was ecstatic and joyful and celebrating and pleasurable and loving and wonderful and would you be willing to experience being absolutely blown away by the people in your relationships? <laughs> well, that's what it's about, you see. Now, you'd be surprised at what kind of work you can do in the space of ecstasy. So you're trying to get them straightened out with no ecstasy. Very hard. <laughs> you create some ecstasy in the relationship and watch how fast they move. <laughs> no sense working uphill. Hi, Werner. My name is Jonathan. Good to see you, Jonathan. I have... I have this sense. There... My feeling of relationship with you, I get an analogy between your relationship with me and my relationship with my father and a woman in my life and others who I don't relate to, or who won't relate to me, rather, in the sense that they won't play with me, that they will withhold and deny and not be intimate with me. And I just wonder what your experience is how it looks to you and how it how it could look to me where I come to them from that kind of um, love and acceptance and there's no play on the other side they yeah. won't play yeah you see that look I want you to know there's that, no relationship well okay let, I, the, I, you see my answer is not at all complex it's really very simple and its power is not in the brilliance of the response, but in the fact that what I'm about to tell you is very real. I'm telling you the truth. And I'm not telling you the truth just for me. I'm telling you what's really so about those people. I'm telling you that their inability to respond, their bound upness, is the highest expression of love which they can muster. Now look. They may, you may be smarter than they are, they may be smarter than you are. You may be richer than they are, they may be richer than you are. You may be more clever, more communicable, they may be more clever, more communicable. None of those things, about none of those things can I speak. The one, or will I know the answer? About this I know the answer. They have the capacity for love. They have a capacity for love like yours and like mine, which is absolute. The only thing bound up in their life is the expression of that capacity. So what you're getting is a, is a bound expression of an absolute love for you. And if you can accept that as their love for you, and if you can be in ecstasy about that expression, if you can be joyful and celebrate that expression, your joy, your ecstasy, your being blown away by your relationship with them, I promise you will provide the heat necessary to melt whatever's there. Miracles will happen. This next exercise you can do with your eyes open or closed. It's a series of questions for you to answer to yourself. There aren't any right or wrong answers. It's just an opportunity for you to look at where you are in your relationships now. Please answer this question. 
I'll ask it a few times. Just keep answering it with whatever is so for you at the time I ask it. Are you willing for your relationships to work? Thank you. Are you willing for your relationships to work? Thank you. Are you willing to experience satisfaction in your relationships? Thank you. Are you willing to experience completion in your relationships? Thank you. Are you willing to experience aliveness in your relationships? Thank you. Are you willing to experience certainty in your relationships? Good. Are you willing to experience satisfaction in your relationships? Thank you. This is a slightly different one. We'll continue. Okay. Regarding the relationship of you to yourself, who is the source of the experience of love? I'll give that one to you again. Regarding you to yourself, that is your relationship with yourself, who is the source of the experience of love? Good. In your relationship with another or others, who creates the experience of love? Answer this for yourself, not for anybody else. Good. In the relationship of another with you, who is the source of love? Good. Of a relationship of another to someone else, who creates the experience of love? Remember to answer that for yourself. In the relationship of someone else with someone else, who creates the experience of love? Good. In this universe, who is the source of love? Thank you. In this universe, in any part of this universe, who is the source of love? Good. Who do you need in order to be loved? For those of you who didn't get it that time, <laughs> who do you need in order to experience love? In your universe, who could withhold love? In your universe, if love is scarce, who isn't creating it? Thank you. <laughs> Terrific, isn't it? <laughs>